everyone. This is Achuta Bhava from Nightlight Astrology. Happy Monday, everybody. Today, we're going to take a look at a birth chart and a question that I received from a viewer um, about this chart. It's a really good question. I'm sure that a lot of people have similar questions, so I thought it would make for a good video today. It's a little bit of a slow week astrologically. We'll be tracking the entrance of Venus into Virgo. Sun is changing signs into Leo. We'll be looking at the full moon in Aquarius by the end of the week. That one's pretty potent because it picks up the conjunction with Pluto right before it perfects. That's on Friday. Uh, so that's kind of the agenda for the week. It's a little bit of a slow week. I'm still uh, technically on vacation right now, but I, I'm making content each day. I'm just not seeing clients. Um, and so at any rate, um, one of the reasons that I do these teaching uh, videos is because I know that a lot of you at home are studying astrology on your own. You don't have the time or maybe the resources to take a class. Uh, and so I know that it's really helpful to have actual instructional videos on reading charts from time to time. Uh, so today's video, the question came in and I thought it was a really good question. Um, it's actually a question about Muhammad Ali's birth chart, but the birth chart, it could be any chart. The question is really important, which was, I know this is paraphrasing the question. I know that Muhammad Ali was a prize fighter. And so I look at his chart and I can see, um, you know, I can see that symbolism in his chart. But I'm not sure that if I didn't know that about him, that I would have been able to say he's, he's going to be a prize fighter. Should I be able to say that looking at someone's chart? And where and how could I see in Muhammad Ali's chart that he would be a prize fighter if I didn't already know that he was? Good questions. Really good questions. Some of them a little bit philosophical. Some have to do with the actual learning of astrology. And then some technical pieces about his chart. So we'll look at those. Um, first of all, it is very normal when learning astrology for there to be a certain portion of your education that is done with hindsight. Like for, for years, in fact, you should be using hindsight in order to learn and uh, develop your interpretive skills. What, is, what does that mean? It means you should be able to take a look at a friend's chart and let's say the friend gives you their chart to study. A great exercise is for you. You know some biographical details about their life. You know, for example, that their parents split up, or you know, for example, that they work in IT, or you, you know, for example, that your friend is really athletic, or let's say that you know, for example, that your friend has a pattern of dating guys that have been like this. <laughs> uh, hopefully not bad, but <clears throat> so then with that knowledge, you sit down and now this of course, the prerequisite to all of this is that you have some interpretive techniques and understanding of how to interpret planet signs, houses, and aspects in the Hellenistic mode. Obviously, I'm speaking now as a Hellenistic astrologer, but I think this is applicable to any other type of astrology. So if you're sitting down and you have some knowledge, some, some skills, inter interpretive skills, and you know that biographical detail about the person's life, sitting down and looking at a chart and saying, now I know this fact about this life, where do I see it in the chart? And then um, whittling it down. Sometimes there's a chart will speak to the same thing in multiple different ways. There's sometimes called the rule of three. You know, you can, if you see the same kind of themes uh, in three different places in the chart, then you can, you know, you can bet your bottom dollar that that's going to be something to, worth talking about to the client. Um, but let's just say that you, uh, you, you find it in the chart, that work of locating through the symbols something that you already know is not hands-off it's not illegal it's not cheating we're not psychics as astrologers some astrologers may have psychic ability but astrologers are not psychics we're like karmic weathermen and so our job is to learn how and where symbols show up to say different things and we need as much exposure to different things and different placements of the symbols saying different things as possible and most of that in the beginning is not going to happen predictably it's going to happen through hindsight here's a detail where do you see it here's a fact about the life where do you see it here's a personality trait where do you see it and it's not that any answer is correct and so you know at some point having the guidance of a teacher classroom peers um is really important because it's going to hold you accountable and make sure you're getting the answers right because it's not just any answer that's correct. But um, you know, even at home, you should be able to, in the early stages of your development as an astrologer with Hellenistic tools, um, knowing which houses represent what, looking at the rulers of certain houses, looking at aspects from one uh, topical ruler to another, knowing which planet naturally signifies love or whatever the case may be. 
you should be able to pick up on things, big facts, big biographical details about a person's life fairly easily by looking at a chart. The more that you do that, the more you start building up, um, you know, kind of an almanac, a diviner's almanac um, in your mind. And you start being able to identify or recognize different ways in which the symbols can play out. And this is important to do because the symbols don't just play out in one way. It would be way too big of an ask um, for people to sit down and do predictive astrology right off the bat without having developed that network of associative symbolism through houses, planets, signs, and aspects and dignities and so forth. Um, you know, Saturn in the 10th house could mean that you do something for a living that's Saturn-like. Saturn in the 10th house could mean that there's a certain degree of confinement or isolation in the type of work you do or the life that you lead. Saturn in the 10th house could mean that, um, you know, that you're an outcast in society somehow. Like there's, because the symbols are multivalent, again, um, you're going to need lots of different scenarios in order to um, not, re let's say, refine your predictive abilities, but never you're never perfecting them. When I sit down with a client, I'm usually going to offer them a range of possibilities. Here I see this planet in this house. Um, I think it's speaking to these topics, and here are some of the different ways it might be speaking to them. Please give me some feedback. That's very common for astrologers to do, to ask for context from the client when they're asking questions, to ask for um, feedback when you're making interpretations. By doing that, we're able to more... Um, accurately hone in on the, the specific ways in which those multivalent um, archetypes are playing out in a person's life. So first of all, it's just really normal. <clears throat> so hindsight is 2020, and that's not out of bounds when you're an astrologer learning. Uh, as you go along, of course, you, you don't want, you, you want to be able to make um, predictions, of course, and you want to be able to describe things more and more accurately or get closer to the bullseye. But the analogy that I always use is in the, you know, in astrology, if you try to make the most specific concrete prediction, you're likely to miss the dartboard altogether, throwing for the, for the bullseye. Whereas if you throw for the board, which means you, you hone in on a symbol, but offer a, a, a range of consistent archetypal descriptors for a client, one of those descriptors will hit the bullseye and the client doesn't feel um, you know, cheated of anything because they can see as you're describing the different ways the symbols could play out that they all are similar uh, intimations of the same thing. And then they're just, the, they're then saying, ah, that's the one that really fits my situation. So at any rate, it's normal to not be able to look at Muhammad Ali's birth chart, in other words, and, you know, if you, if you're newer and if you're developing your skills to look at it and go, well, you know, I don't think I would have been able to guess that he was a prize fighter. Well, me either. I, but as time has gone on, I can tell you that fighter would be one of the words that I would now choose to describe his chart. Although fighter for what a physical fighter, ideological fighter, hard to say, but you will be able to get closer and closer to the essence of what his chart is about over time. And I'll hopefully this will, I'll, I'll be able to illustrate this with his birth chart. So I'm going to put his birth chart on the screen now and just show you like wh where and how we can see that he was indeed a, a prize fighter among other things, right? But that was one of obviously the things that made him most famous. So <clears throat> here is his birth chart on the screen. Now, again, the question was, if I, you know, if I didn't know um, this, I'm not sure I would have seen it. Where can I see it? So there's a few ways that we can see it. First of all, you know, let's look at the 10th house. When you're looking at the 10th house, you're saying, well, what, what does this person do for a living? That's one of the possibilities of the 10th house. Public reputation, um, a person's you know, it's, it's associated in Indian astrology with the word arta, which would mean the development of power, reputation, wealth, esteem, eminence in the world. So here's that 10th house. Now, um, we see Saturn and Mars both in the 10th house. So one of the things that we can do in this chart is say, well, what would Muhammad Ali have done for a living or what may he have gained esteem or honor or recognition from? Now, that doesn't mean that we can just look at 10th house planets and go, oh, there's 10th house planets. They must be famous. No, I mean, 
relative to one's station in life, um, we, we have to look for different eminence factors. But the point here is just, where can we see the potential for someone who, um, you know, to, to become known for uh, being a fighter? So, of course, the low-hanging fruit is Mars. Mars, the god of war, is in the 10th place. Okay, so fair enough. One of the things you could say right away is that he has an angular Mars. An angular Mars will often mean that someone has some kind of executive power or warlike qualities in the workplace, or that there will be, um, a, you know, strength, power, muscle, assertion, leadership, those kinds of qualities. But that doesn't alone say boxer. I mean, it, you could certainly put that, it might be a good guess that you would get that, but but it's the Mars-like qualities. So if you talk to a client and you say, look, it looks to me as though Mars will be on display in your life and you may gain honors or esteem, or you may do well at jobs that feature Mars-like things. Well, what, what do Mars-like things include? And that's where you can start unpacking some of the options. You say Mars is a god of war. If you say Mars is the god of war, as you're describing the different possibilities to Muhammad Ali, <laughs> just say he's your astrology client, then he would be like, well, I'm a fighter. So there you go. And that's what I mean by throwing for the board, you'll hit the bullseye. But you just, you say, these are the kinds of things you could gain honor, recognition, status. You, you're, you may do um, some of something Mars-like for your career, but it's not just Mars. It's also the combination of Mars and Saturn. So with Saturn here, when you put Saturn and Mars together, you get that sense of confinement, discipline, constraint, seriousness, focus, um, and then you're blending that with the God of War. Well, one Mars Saturn um, common symbolism for Mars and Saturn will be the military or, or martial arts or martial discipline, uh, you know, an Olympic, you know, um, bodybuilder or something that requires a lot of um, both effort and discipline, perseverance and uh, strength and muscle, but also um, the kind of stoic hard quality of someone who you know, like a drill sergeant or boot camp these are the kinds of things that can come together through saturn and mars um now you could also unpack those symbols on a variety of other levels for example muhammad ali is a civil rights icon muhammad ali is an anti-war activist etc he um becomes um, muslim and uh, so he, you know, in terms of a, a major change of status in the eyes of the world that could, you know, make a person a more controversial figure, Saturn, again, in the 10th house, those are quite common um, motifs for people with Saturn in the 10th. So anyway, some of the themes here of Saturn and Mars are pointing to um, exactly what he, what he is and what he does as a fighter, um, you know, as a as a as an activist and 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 as someone who's has a major identity change in his lifetime, um, okay. So now that's but that that alone isn't enough. I I wouldn't necessarily go okay. You know, here's where you know I look at his chart and I just go that's it. It's usually a combination of factors. For example, in his chart, the other thing to pay attention to is his ascendant is in Leo, sign of the sun. We want to take a look at the sun in every birth chart. But here we see that the sun is in Capricorn in the sixth house. And this is going to describe his personality, his physical characteristics and traits, vitality, health, demeanor. Well, this is a this is this is to me is the dead giveaway in his chart. Why is that? Because the sixth house was traditionally called the joy of Mars. And it was a house associated with warriors and soldiers and fighting. It was associated with martyrs, people who would die for a cause, people who selflessly serve something that's difficult or in a difficult environment, say like a, say like a medic or a, on, the war, on the battlefield or a surgeon who has to go in and cut things up or people, maybe social workers or freedom fighters or uh, you know, social activists or people who have fight in them. And this is a big part of what they do, fight or serve. Uh, there could be um, a degree of suffering or sickness or even slavery that are a part of what a person is dealing with. And obvi obviously, I mean, um, I'm talking about figurative slavery for the most part, but obviously 
um, you know, you can you can be quite literal about this. In the ancient world, there you needed to have houses that could cover literal slavery. So, um, and of, of course, still applicable in our modern world, not very long ago. At any rate, um, we have the ascendant ruler then as the sun in the sixth house, the joy of Mars. What's interesting about it is that then you're taking the sun in Saturn sign, Capricorn, and you're putting it in a trine with its ruler, Saturn, in the 10th house. So now we know that this sun and Capricorn sixth house character is connected to that Saturn Mars in the 10th. Not only this, but dignities are a big deal. It's in Saturn sign, but it's also in the exaltation of Mars. Capricorn is the domicile of Saturn and the exaltation of Mars. So we have a very, very Marsy sun here. Why? Because it's in the joy of Mars in the sixth house. It's in Mars's exaltation. It's in a whole sign trine to Mars, applying square if you take it across the sign boundary. And it's also in a trine to its host Saturn in the 10th. So everything about that sun connects back to Mars and Saturn. Um, so when I look at his chart, I think, gosh, this personality is going to be very, you know, six house Capricorn suns, you know, these are, these are tough people, um, people who are often going to be um, very determined, steely, um, hard nosed, uh, sometimes they're, you know, they're going to have that uh, chip on their shoulder, and um, potentially can also struggle with health problems. Um, so one of the problems of the sixth house is that the sixth house is being drawn down by the primary motion into the underworld. So it was associated with degenerative chronic health problems. And Muhammad Ali dies of a degenerative disease. But the, the point here is also that, again, if I'm an astrologer and I'm looking at his chart, could I look at all of this and say prize fighter? Probably not. But here are some things. I'm just going to write them down so you can see them. These are some things that I would say. I would say determined sixth house Mars-like personality, um, hard, concrete, um, persevering. Uh, let's see. I'm going to put in um, disciplined, martial, um, I'm going to put in uh, things like, uh, let's see, um, goal-oriented, right? So these are the kinds of things that I end up coming up with. Now, if I'm sitting down and I'm talking to Muhammad Ali and I'm saying, hey, look, it's a sixth house sun. It's a Marsy Saturny sun. You know, those are your characteristics. You got Mars and Saturn in the 10th. It's Etc. You could even go to the earthy side of the, the element of Taurus and Capricorn. You're going to hit pretty close to home. Now, of course, there's lots of other elements in his chart to interpret as well. For example, the story around his marriages are really interesting. I read his Wikipedia bio, so I'm not like an expert on Muhammad Ali, but um, you know, he's got Venus retrograde in the seventh. He has a few pretty turbulent marriages. Um, there's a degree of violence in some of the marriages. Um, he's also got uh, you know, there's, you could read, for example, the fact that um, he's got a moon mercury conjunction, he's a very compelling speaker It was one of the things, you know, the way he talked, I was so compelling. So a lot of different things in his chart that we could speak to outside of just he was a fighter, right. But the point here is just to, to notice patterns, you start, you see a dominant Mars, and then all of a sudden you see the ascendant ruler in the exaltation of Mars and in the joy of Mars and um, with uh, an applying square to Mars, whole sign trine, but applying degree base square to Mars. See that Saturn Mars up at the 10th. That's when you start to get the archetypal outlines of the thing that you're And suddenly the point is that by the end of this, you're not going, well, I never would have been able to tell that he was a prize fighter. The goal is not to be able to say, oh, this chart prize fighter. The goal is to be able to say, you're going to do these specific kinds of things in these specific areas of life. And you're going to have um, a, a little range of archetypal descriptions. But if you're, if you become good at seeing consistent repetition of patterns in a chart, like the ones that I just went over, you'll get pretty close to the bullseye. You will. And that's more important than being able to sit down and say, Muhammad Ali, you will be a famous prize fighter. Um, because with the client, what we're really trying to do after all is what 
I mean, when I'm reading a birth chart for someone, I'm trying to say, Hey, you know, this is what it's going to, this is what your life will be like more or less in these different areas. And I want to describe them in the way that I just said, then a person who already knows their life goes, okay, yeah, I see. And then they may ask questions. Do you think it could be like this? I know the symbols. And so I go, no, I think that's probably a little too extreme. You know, let's dial it back a notch or a person says, Oh, is it going to be so great like this? And I say, maybe not that great, but yeah, it'll be, it'll be pretty good. So we're then people, as we describe the symbols, we help them adjust and uh, adjust their expectations in different areas of life. Um, usually balancing out extremes that people have in their heads, but more importantly, most people are coming in for forecasting. So if I'm sitting down with a client, and I'm doing some forecasting work for them. I need that natal context to know what kinds of things are, what the parameters of the birth chart tell us is possible. And then when I'm doing forecasting, if I say, look, these are the different types of things likely to happen in this area of life, the client knowing their life is already going to be much more, um, they're going to be aware of what the most likely scenarios are that are playing out. If I say, for example, hey, look, Saturn's about to enter your career house. It could represent these five different types of things that are happening. That person is going to know probably more than I do exactly which of those five Saturn expressions is most likely to play out. But even if, even if we, they say, okay, well that, I think that's the most likely one. I'm going to change jobs a year down the line, they get a promotion. They don't change jobs, but they get a promotion. But one of the things that I said about Saturn was that, you know, hard work and discipline pays off when Saturn's in your 10th house, they're going to go, huh, that's funny. I remember he said, I could probably, I could get a promotion. And I thought I'd change jobs. So, you know, if, if a weatherman gets on and says, look, it's going to be mostly cloudy. It could, it's going to rain probably, you know, good chance of rain between, you know, 10 and 4 PM. Okay. 10 AM and 4 PM. And I go out in the morning and it's overcast and go, the weatherman was right. It's overcast and uh, looks like it's going to rain. And then maybe there's a few drops in the afternoon, but it doesn't, it doesn't fully rain. Um, do I say, do I think to myself, well, the weatherman was totally off. No, I've had an, an, an experience very much like what the weatherman described. Was it exactly what the weatherman described? No, but it was pretty close. That's what we, that's, that's really our goal as astrologers is to be able to be, you know, the weather changes, our choices affect um, things karmically. Um, but we want to be able to more or less describe between this time in your life and that time, these types of things are likely to occur. Um, and then when a person goes through them, they feel prepared. Um, and they, they also, they feel they remember when these things play out, that there is a divine intelligence guiding things and it gives us comfort. So at any rate, I hope that this lesson today was helpful for all of you out there studying on your own. Um, I, again, this week's a little bit of a slow week for me. We'll have, um, a few more, there'll be some more chart demos, and then we'll be taking a look at Venus into Virgo and the full moon on Friday. All right. Well, I hope you guys are having a, um, a good, uh, good start to your week and I look forward to more soon. Take it easy, everyone. Bye.